has the church replaced Israel? And the subtitle is A Devilish Delusion. Uh, and that's exactly what it is, saints. We're going to see this morning that the church has not replaced Israel. Uh, and we're going to see some amazing things as we look into the words. So I want you to bow your hearts with me this morning. And we're going to ask the Lord to bless. Father God, we love you. And again, it's always a privilege to stand before you first and, Lord, also before your people. I ask today, O oh God, that, that you would breathe afresh on the word of truth. Holy Spirit, I ask this morning that you would open the word of God to our hearts. Let our hearts burn within us as you teach us your word. Lord, this morning, give us clarity, give us understanding, give us sound doctrine regarding the nation of Israel. Lord, I believe that you brought Israel back, dear God, by divine providence. And Lord, I pray today, O oh God, give us understanding, dear God, where we can communicate this message to a dying world. Now, Lord, we love you and we glorify you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to bring in our Bible prophecy chart here, and it's a chart of time. I hope you can see it there. It's a chart of time. We are currently in what's called the church age or the dispensation of the church. Uh, this is a great time. Uh, Christ is using the body of Christ. But we do know that the Bible teaches that there are some other uh, dispensations that are coming. Uh, we do know uh, the next uh, major dispensation will be that of the, of the Great Tribulation or the time of wrath. Uh, in that tribulation, uh, the nation of Israel will be there. Then we have what's called the millennial reign or the thousand year reign of Christ. And here our Savior, Jesus Christ, he was literally reign uh, uh, on his throne. He, was, he would be seated as king, lord, head of state, uh, potentate, prime minister. He will rule the world. But what we're going to see today that, uh, that as the dispensation progress, God is up to something. We're going to see today that uh, God has a, has a plan for the nation of Israel. Uh, that's one reason why God has brought her back into world history. And again, we're going to see how that's going to play out uh, going forward. I want to start off with a verse here in the book of Romans, two verses here in the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse number 1 and 2. The apostle Paul writing, he said, I say then, have God cast away his people? He said, God forbid. For I am also an Israeli of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God have not cast away his people, which he foreknew. And again, uh, this, this, these two verses here really says it all. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Now, what's amazing, we're going to see today, saints, that there are many groups out there today that literally, literally believe that, 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 that Israel has no relevance for our time. And I say this, saints, if you don't understand that they do, uh, you don't understand the word of God. Uh, you really don't understand what the Bible says. I mean, listen, uh, our future uh, is, is, is dependent on the nation of Israel being here. Uh, I mentioned last night, uh, we cannot go to the end of the world without Israel. Israel has to be here in order for Bible prophecy to, to complete. Well, we're going to see some amazing things this morning. I want to uh, quote uh, Charles Spurgeon. Listen to what he said. He said, I think we do not attach significant uh, importance on the restoration of the Jews. He said, we do not think enough about it, but certainly if there is anything promised in the Bible, it is this. And that is that Israel is going to be here. Listen, we don't, we don't talk a lot about it, but listen, the word of God promised it. Uh, I use all the time the fact that, that Israel has come back into world history as a major sign to prove the validity of the word of God. People say, Brother Perkins, how do you know that Bible is real? Uh, what about the Quran? What about the Book of Mormon? I said, well, one way we know the Bible is real because of prophetic word. We have a Bible that is centuries old where, uh, that prophets are being, uh, being fulfilled before our very eyes this very day. It proves that this book is written under the unction of the Holy Spirit. I want to quote one other guy, Dr. Walter uh, Kaiser. He said, to argue that God replaced Israel with a church is to depart from, listen at this, an enormous body of biblical evidence. In other words, if, you, if you're going to believe that Israel is done with, Israel has no place in the future, you got to get rid of a lot of scriptures. I'm going to give you some scriptures today. I'm going to show you that Israel is, is vital to the end times, and God has raised this little, uh, little nation up uh, to fulfill his will. 
As a topical teacher, I want to give you some topics this morning. Uh, we're going to cover some of them pretty fast. But first of all, I will define what is re replacement theology. Also, I'll give you a brief history of replacement theology. We'll see replacement theology in the church today. Then I'll give you reasons why this uh, replacement theology is erroneous. Uh, it's, it's an error. Uh, then we'll see the church and Israel in relationship. And then last, Israel has a divine future. And again, we'll see some beautiful things uh, as the scripture uh, uh, un, uh, uh, unfolds. Now, what is replacement theology? Uh, to give you a definition, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you two, uh, two scholars uh, rendering of what it is, and it'll give us a clear understanding of what this teaching is. I want to start with Dr. Dave Reagan. He said this, replacement theology is the idea that God replaced the Jews with the church, that the church has become the new Israel, and that the church has inherited all the blessings that were previously given to the Jews. Needless to say, these ideas have served as a source of much of anti-Semitism that has characterized the church for the past 1600 years. And those who, believe in, those who believe in it constitutes a majority of professing Christians today. Accordingly, they consider, listen at this, they consider uh, the modern day Israel to be an accident of history with no spiritual significance whatsoever. Therefore, they would deny that God has any special plans for the Jewish people in the end times. Isn't that amazing? They don't believe that Israel has any biblical significance today. That makes no sense to me. I don't understand that. We have the nation of Israel, Pastor. Israel is back on the map. National Geographic had to change its maps after 1948 to go back to the biblical name Israel. I don't understand that. I want to quote one other scholar, Dr. David Hawkins, in his book, Replacement Theology. He said, the simplest definition of replacement theology is that it refers to those who believe that the church has replaced Israel in God's prophetic plan. The argument is that Israel, listen at this, by disobedience and sin, have forfeited its right to exist as a nation and its right to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. Some believe that the church has fulfilled what God promised to Israel, and therefore Israel today is not prophetically significant. Some also hold that Israel appears to be a secular state and is not the true Israel of God in the end times. Boy, let me tell you, if, let me say it this way, how many of you are glad that God haven't cast you out for your sins? Let me tell you, we've sinned enough as a Christian for God to uh, exclude us. Some believe that God has totally discounted Israel as a nation because of their sin. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a mistake. We're going to see today that is a mistake. Uh, God has raised this country up in the latter days, and we need to understand it. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a brief history, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Tommy Ice. And again, I, I must give you this as we go toward the scriptures, just to give you some background of what it is. Uh, replacement theology is not a new doctrine. Uh, it, it was called, from a theological term, supersessionism. Uh, uh, that was historically what it was called, but basically, in a nutshell, replacement theology. Uh, and again, we'll give you just a little brief history here. Dr. I said this, what is replacement theology? Replacement theology has been the, uh, uh, the census of the church from the middle of the second century A.D. to the present day, with few exceptions. Even though the, the anti nicene fathers were predominantly premillennial in their understanding of future things, they laid the groundwork or a groundwork that would lead to the rise and development of replacement theology. Premillennialist uh, Justin Martyr was the first to view the Christian, uh, the Christian church as the true spiritual Israel around A.D. 160. Justin's view laid the groundwork for the growing belief that the church had superseded or replaced Israel. He goes on to say, replacement theology is not a new arrival in the theological arena, for it probably has its origins in the early political, uh, uh, um, uh, political, uh, oh my goodness, this word, um, ecclesiastical, that happens sometimes, ecclesiastical alliance forged between uh, 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 Eusebius 
and the Emperor Constantine. Constantine regarded, regarding himself as God's representative in the whole uh, role or in his role as emperor gathered all uh, the bishops together on the 30th anniversary of his reign. The result of that meeting uh, in Eusebius' mind uh, made it unnecessary to distinguish any longer between the church and the empire. They appeared, listen at this, to merge into one fulfilled kingdom, kingdom of God on earth in the present time. Such a maneuver, of course, nicely evacuated the role and significance of the Jewish people in any kingdom consideration. Here began the long trail of replacement theology. And again, saints, again, this, this, this doctrine is not new. Uh, this teaching, you'd be surprised. I'm, I'm going to quote a few of the, of the church fathers, but uh, some of the church fathers who we hold in high uh, uh, esteem, uh, they really did not consider Israel to be relevant during their times. And again, I, I just really believe that it was, it was just a false thing. Uh, one reason, a lot of times, because Israel, Israel was not around uh, 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 during, their, during their reign. You know, I have books in my office uh, at home where uh, their uh, 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 scholars predicted Israel's restoration, and they predicted it based on the word of God. But during their time of the writings, Israel was not around. So therefore, a lot of them, because they didn't see Israel around, they really had no vision for Israel ever coming back. And again, a lot of the church fathers believed uh, in replacement uh, theology. Now, let's look at replacement theology in the church today. Today, there are many prominent leaders in the church who are against the latter-day restoration of the modern state of Israel. They believe Israel has no relevance for today, and embracing her, they believe, is a waste of time. I believe they are ignoring one major fact that God has brought Israel back into world history. Israel is generally rejected today because she is seen as a secular nation in sin. But this is one, listen to this, but this is the exact condition that God said he would find her in when he would restore life to her again. This is a serious mistake to replace Israel with the church. There are many physical prophecies, we're going to see some of them today, physical prophecies toward the nation of Israel that must be fulfilled. Every jot and tittle of the word of God will come to pass, and Israel has a major part in that fulfillment. Again, it says we're going to see that Israel is vital. Israel is major in the end times. Israel is a part of God's prophetic future, and God has a plan for them. And, and God has a plan for the church and Israel. We're going to see that uh, as it plays out. But I want to show you again some of the prominent church leaders and some of their views against Israel. And I want to give you one here. This is Chuck Colson. Uh, I really like Chuck Colson's ministry when he was alive. You know, he had, I think he had a prison ministry and he did a really good work. But I got to say, uh, he did not understand Israel. He didn't understand Bible prophecy. Listen what Chuck Colson said about Israel. He said, I think it is problematic to relate prophecy to current events unfolding uh, in the nation state of Israel. There may be some relationship, of course, only God knows, but the secular state of Israel created in 1948 is not, in my understanding, identical to the Jewish people as God's chosen and called out covenant people. I strongly support Israel because, of its, because it is a haven for persecuted Jews, not because I think it, is, it fulfills Bible prophecy. I also support, listen at this, I also support a Palestinian state, both from historical and providential considerations given to the state, given the state of affairs in the Middle East, a Palestinian state is the only practical solution for peace. That is wrong. That's replacement theology. And I just say uh, he don't understand Bible prophecy. Simply, he don't understand Bible prophecy. Listen, saints, Israel is major. Israel is God's prophetic time clock. Uh, it's like, you know, when Israel became a nation in 1940, it, it's, like, it's, like, it's like Bible prophecy started speeding up the fulfillment. As I shared the other night, there are many prophecies that were literally waiting on Israel to arrive. And once that nation was birthed back in the world history by divine providence of God, many prophetic things begin to click into it and things begin to happen. 
Let me quote another one here. This is uh, Justin Martyr. Again, he's a, he's a, he's a Christian back in, uh, uh, way back. <laughs> uh, listen to what he said. He claimed God's covenant with Israel was no longer valid and that the Gentiles had replaced the Jews. Additionally, he was the first to identify the church as the true spiritual Israel. And he declared that the plight of the Jews, their exile and persecution had happened in fairness and justice because they had slain the just one. He put all that on Israel, all that guilt on Israel. You know something, saints? It wasn't, it wasn't Israel that killed Jesus. You know what killed Jesus? Our sin. You know something? Uh, uh, you can't blame all of that on Israel. I mean, God used them uh, to fulfill his will, but you cannot blame it. Listen, if Jesus hadn't died, all of us would be in sin today. It, this was God's will. Jesus said this. He said, no man take my life. He said, I lay it down of myself. He told Pilate, you can't take my life, Pilate. I'm going to lay my life down. Uh, Some men too, saints, you know, he couldn't have died on the cross without Father God laying our sins on him. He was sinless. There was no sin in him, so death had no part of him. The only way he died, humanity's sin was placed on him at Calvary, allowing death to touch his body. You remember the cross, saints, when Jesus was on that cross and our sins were placed on him, and the Bible says that Father God, he turned his, his face from him, and Jesus looked up and said, Father God, why have thou forsaken me? The Savior had never experienced separation from God. But that moment he did when our sins were placed on him. Let me tell you something. Uh, uh, you can't blame this on Israel. Uh, you got to blame it on every one of us. Our sins took him to the cross. Uh, look at this one. I, I really like this. This is amazing here. Uh, 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 Eusebius of, of Caesarea, he said, he taught that the promises of Scripture were meant for the Gentiles and the curses were for the Jews. He exerted uh, 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 he, uh, he exerted that, that the church was the true Israel. And again, many people hold that view, but again, it's not, it's not a right view. Uh, a, lot, a lot of these guys, I mean, they, they were well intended uh, in their views, but they were wrong. They were, they were wrong. Uh, and what amazed me today is the ones that we meet today in the 21st century who don't believe that Israel has any significance. And I say, boy, you guys have a lot of problems. Because we have so much things, so many things happening in Israel today that is proof that the word of God is true and that Israel is here by divine providence. Now, the New Testament teaches that God will receive Israel and cleanse their sins. And the reason why I want to give you this because, again, some of them believe that Israel has been disqualified because of sin. Well, let me give you a New Testament verse here. Uh, this is Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 and 9. Uh, the, the writer of Hebrews said this, for finding fault with them, he said, behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and regarding not uh, uh, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. He said, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will, put, uh, I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful. Listen to this to the unrighteous, to their unrighteousness and, uh, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that, he said, a new covenant, he have made the first old, now that which decayeth and wax old is ready to vanish away. Listen, sin has not stopped God's covenant toward the nation of Israel. Now, God deals with sin. We're gonna see that as we go forward. Our Father God does not play with sin. He deals with sin. He judges sin, but I thank God, saying that we have a God that's a merciful God. The scripture tells us every morning that his mercy is renewed every morning. How many need his mercy every morning? I need his mercy every morning, saints. I wake up looking for mercy, and I say, God, I thank you for mercy. 
His mercy helps us live a godly life where his mercy will also be extended toward the house uh, of Israel. Now, let me give you some reasons why I believe replacement theology is erroneous. It's a, it's a false doctrine that must be dealt with. So I'm going to give you a number of reasons why I believe it. Number one, the word of God teaches that this was an unconditional covenant made with Abraham. When God made this covenant with Abraham, uh, the land covenant, it was unconditional. And I want to give you this. Look at this. Genesis chapter 1, I mean chapter 12, verses 1, and 1 through 3. He said, Now the Lord have said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I show thee, and I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and, I, uh, uh, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless uh, them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He goes on to say here in chapter 15, verse 18, in the same day the Lord made the covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed, listen at this, have I given this land from the rivers Egypt unto the great river Euphrates? Boy, that's, 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 some, that's a lot of land, saints. This is what God promised Abraham, and the Israelis have never fully occupied all of what God promised, but they will in the future. This is one of those prophecies that let us know that God uh, is still in covenant with Israel. And this is a physical prophecy that God will literally fully complete toward the house of Israel as they go into the millennial kingdom. Let me tell you something, saints. It was an unconditional covenant that God made with Abraham. And again, many people have tacked all these different things to it, uh, uh, totally trying to disqualify Israel. Uh, they shouldn't do it. Now, here's another reason. The word of God teaches a physical restoration of, of, of the nation of Israel. In other words, God says he's going to bring the nation back. So look at this. The book of Amos, chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. Amos wrote under the unction of the Holy Spirit. He said, and I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them, listen at this, upon their own land. And they shall no more be pulled out of their land, which I uh, have given them, said the Lord thy God. Here, God says that he's going to bring them back. He's going to bring them, bring them back. He's going to put them back in their own land. You can't spiritualize that one. And see, what has happened in the church, we have, we have spiritualized a lot of these prophecies to try to make them fit the church. But this, this is a prophecy uh, tied to the land. Yeah, God says he's going he's gonna to restore the land. Look at this one. The word of God teaches a physical return of the Jews to the nation of Israel. Look at this, Jeremiah 23, verse number 7. He said, therefore, behold, the days come, said the Lord, that they shall no more say the Lord liveth, which, which, built, I mean, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country. And from all countries, whether I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. This prophecy talks about an ingathering of the physical Jew. Yeah, this is not, you can't spiritualize this one. God scattered the, the, the Israelis all over the world. And in the latter days, he said, I'm going to bring them back from where I scattered them. And listen, saints, he's doing that. Yeah, he's doing that. Uh, just of late, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the tribe of Manasseh have just returned to Israel from India. I, mean, I, I said, wow, the tribe of Manasseh? And they, and they verified them, and now they have allowed them to migrate back to Israel. I said, God, you, you are amazing. Yeah, let me give you another one. Look at this. Here's another reason why replacement theology is no good. The word of God pr uh, promises that Israel's existence is as permanent as the universe. You know what, God, 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 God's amazing. He said, I'm going I'm I'm, I'm to give you something. I'm going to give you a statement that is so radical that you cannot even deal with it. He said, I'm, I'm going to make it so impossible that you're going to have to believe that Israel has to be here. 
Well, look at this scripture. We, 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 we know it. Jeremiah 31, 35 and 36. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for light by day and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night, which divided the sea when the waves therefore roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, said the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. God boxed himself in. God says, listen, if you can stop the orders of the sun, moon, and stars, God says, then I will cease having Israel as a nation. God said, if you can't stop that, Israel's going to be here. I woke up this morning, saints, and guess what? Israel was here because the sun rose with me. Last night, the moon was out, just nice. Yeah, yeah, it told me that Israel is here. Yeah, it's here, Pastor. It's here. Let me give you another one. Look at this, Jeremiah 31, again, verse 37. He said, thus said the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth stretched out beneath, God says, I will, I will cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, said the Lord. Now listen to this. God says, now, if you can come to heaven and measure heaven, God says, then I'll cast Israel away. He's talking about you. Can you go up to heaven and measure heaven? No, you can't even get to heaven without him. All right, he said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do better. If you can stretch out the whole earth and measure that, I'll cease to have Israel as a nation. Let me tell you some things. God, God, God showed us that this nation has to be here in the latter days. Uh, the church has not replaced Israel. Uh, God has brought her, brought her back. I mean, God has brought her back. And again, God has to fulfill the word of God. Let me give you one more here. Look at this one. Jeremiah 33. Verse 25, 26, along the same lines, dealing with a permanent uh, uh, Israel. Thus said the Lord God, thus said the Lord, if my covenant be not with the day and night, and if I have appointed the ordinances of the heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David, my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be ruler over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I will uh, cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. Boy, that's beautiful, man. God says, listen, he, God tied Israel's return to the universe. God says, hey, they're going to be here. I'm going to bring them back to their land. Uh, this is a physical prophecy that must be physically fulfilled. And again, for them to discount that, is, again, is throwing away a lot of scripture. Now, the New Testament affirms the Old Testament expectation of salvation for national Israel. And I want to give you some. I like this verse here. Uh, I'll save you talking. This is Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. Listen to what Jesus said this. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now here Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's telling them and those that are born again, if you, you continue with me, he said, there's gonna come a day where you sit with me in my throne. But listen, listen what he says, sit with my throne judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This tells me that there's a future for the 12 tribes of Israel. That's, that's lineage, that's, that's physical Jews that would be in the millennial kingdom. Yeah. He said, they're going to be here. Uh, Jews, literal Jews, will, will, will literally come to Christ and be saved during the millennial kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, salvation is expected. God, God has not given up on Israel. Uh, he has not done that. Look at this next one. I like this one. Uh, Psalms. Verse, uh, Psalms 80, uh, 89, verses 30 through 37, uh, it gives us the promises, or God's promise to Israel are not based on, on, on his, I'm sorry, let me slow down. God's promises to Israel are based on his covenant and not on their performance. Now again, saints, God does judge sin, but you gotta understand, son, this, this covenant is, is bigger. Look at this, Psalms 89, 30 through 37. He said, if his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgment, they, uh, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, 
Then will I visit their transgressions with the, with the rod and their iniquity with strife. In other words, God says, if they, if they, if they sin, I'm going to deal with the sin. I'm going to judge them. But look what he goes on to say. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun, for, uh, uh, sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in the heavens. Here God says, even though they sin, God says, I'm going to deal with their sin. I'm going to judge their sins. I'm going to deal with it. But God's loving kindness is toward them. You know, when I read some of the uh, church fathers and their views about uh, rejecting Israel, to me, it was so hard to read it. Uh, they said that Israel has totally lost their position. They've lost their right to the land. I said, what? It, it just broke my heart to hear some of the church fathers recite those words. God is a loving God. He's a merciful God. And again, you know, Pastor Joe, I had to, I had to constantly look at my own life. And I said, God, you know, but for your mercy, I wouldn't be here today. Lord, but for your grace and your love for my life, uh, Lord, I wouldn't be here today, Lord. Even as a Christian, Lord, we've done things that disqualify us. But God's a merciful God. Listen, saints, if God is not merciful to Israel, he won't be merciful to us. You got to understand how this thing blesses us as the church as well. Listen, I want God to bless Israel. I want him to bless Israel's socks off. Because as he blessed them, guess what? He's going to bless Brother Perkins. Hey, I need him. I need God in my life. I need his mercy in my life. I need his forgiveness in my life. Yeah. Now, let's look at the church and Israel's relationship. The scriptures are quite clear when it comes to the church as it relates to Israel. It is of great importance that we understand God has a divine plan for the church and Israel. And that both will experience God's mercy and grace given in the gift of salvation. We in the church must understand that we cannot lift ourselves above Israel. As Father God has done to Israel, so will he do also to the church. Everything he promised Israel will come to pass as well as those promises that he's given to the church. But we got to be very careful in these latter day saints not to lift up ourselves above them and you know uh the old saying is when you put somebody else down you automatically raise your own self you know when you put somebody else down or you or you point the finger at somebody you got four or uh, three others coming back at you well four others coming back at you you know listen uh we need to get out of the condemnation business and we need to extend mercy to whoever wants christ and we're going to see that now so let's look at this God warns the church not to boast against Israel. God don't want us to boast against Israel. Romans chapter 11, verse 18 and 20. The apostle writing here, he said, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root beareth thee. He said, Thou wilt then say, he said, uh, thou, thou, thou would then say the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. He said, be not high-minded, but fear. Now, the story is this, that we, the, the church, uh, we Gentiles in the church, we were a wild olive branch that was grafted in. And the Bible said we were grafted in contrary to nature. And, you know, uh, what I found out that uh, even in the natural, uh, in the vineyards, they really cannot graft wild olive trees in, uh, uh, you know, in a, uh, a, a vineyard. What God did was supernatural by bringing us in. And who do we think we are that we're going to just, just, just kick Israel to the curve? Here, Paul said, be not high-minded, but fear. You better, you better have some reverence uh, for what has happened to Israel. You better respect uh, a sovereign God for what he did to Israel. Because listen, what he did to them allowed every one of us to come in. 
But I want you to understand, so we're going to see in a little bit here, that even though God put him on the side for a little bit, that was not permanent. What has happened today in the church, or uh, in the replacement theology, uh, they have put Israel permanently on the side. They have permanently disqualified Israel, and that is not of God. We're going to see it. God warns the church not to boast. Look at this, verse 21 through, 30, uh, 21 through 23. For if God spared not the natural branches, that's Israel, he said, take heed, lest he spare not thee, you old wild olive branch. He said, behold, therefore the goodness and the severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee, toward us, goodness. He said, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not, still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. You know, God is able to bring Israel back in. He's able to graft them back into the family. And again, we have no right to totally disqualify them. And again, for us to boast against Israel, I mean, I meet some Christians, boy, I mean, they are arrogant, man. You know, Israel, God's done with Israel. We, we have re totally replaced Israel. All of Israel's blessings are on us. Yeah? No, 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 you can't do that. No, no, you better, you, you better respect God and have reverence for what has happened to them. Look at this. Israel has a divine future. And I like this because we're going to see that Israel has a divine future. God has a plan for them. Israel has a future with God. Look at this. I love this. Now, this is Apostle Paul. You can read verses 1 through 6, but I'm only going to read verse 1. This was Paul's desire for his people Israel. Paul said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul said, I want them saved. Paul said, I got brethren out there. They are, they are working in the law. He said, they have a zeal of God, but it's not according to knowledge. He said, they are going about working their own righteousness, but it's not according to faith. In other words, they're not yielding to Christ. They're trying to work their way in. Paul said, I want them brothers saved. Paul said, my heart's desire, my prayers is that my brethren come into Christ. And again, you know, I really believe that when people embrace the, the, uh, the replacement theology, they don't witness to the Jews. They have no heart to go toward Israel to help them. Uh, they embrace their enemies, and that is so true. Uh, there's a group uh, called, uh, called Christ at the Checkpoint. I don't know if you ever heard of them. Christ at the Checkpoint, uh, this month, in a, probably about a week or so, uh, they're going to meet in, Jeru uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, and this is a group of Christians, so-called Christians, and Muslims, Palestinians, and they're going to come together claiming to have this unity uh, and this peace and this love. But this whole conference condemns the state of Israel. And was even sad about it, well-known preachers that we know I'm talking about some mega churches, well-known pastors that we know will be a part of that. Some of them will be keynote speakers at this conference. I met a pastor that went to Israel, and he came back, and uh, this, this other uh, gentleman went with him. He came and he said, Brother Perkins, man, we went there, man, and we went into the Palestinian quarters, man, and we saw the big old wall that Israel built. Man, Israel is just doing, it, doing these Palestinians so wrong. I mean, I'm saying, what? I'm trying to li listen. I said, what? I said, brother, don't, don't be deceived by what you're seeing. Let me tell you something. You got to hear me now. I love the Palestinians. I love them. You know why I love them? Because Jesus loved them. I pray that God give them salvation. But let me tell you something. The situation that they're in is by design. They have gotten billions of our dollars, European dollars. Listen, they got so much money that, that they could build their own island. Yeah, but that money was funneled in and out. And they kept the refugee status in order for the world to have pity on the PLO. You got to hear me. And many Christians have embraced this theology, thinking that Israel has no right to the land. I say, man, you don't understand the scriptures. Saints, listen. God said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So if you say pray for it, it means God must be concerned about it, right? Let me tell you something, saints. We, we got to have a right perspective about this. Let's go a little further. Israel has a future. Look at this. Romans, I mean, Romans 11, verse number 15. Look at this. He said, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. 
Paul said, I magnify mine office. He said, if by any means I may provoke to emulation, that means provoke to competition, that I may provoke them which are of my flesh. He said, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall be the receiving of them but life from the dead? Listen, saints, because of their fall, we were grafted in. Now, how much more when they come back? What, 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 what do you think it's going to look like when they come back? Yeah, yeah, God has not totally uh, cast them aside. Father God has a plan to bring the family together. Yeah, the church and Israel, the house of God. This is God's ultimate plan to bring us together, both worshiping the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Israel has a future. Now, look at this. Israel's partial blindness doesn't eliminate their future for salvation. And again, this is what has happened because people say, you know, Israel sinned and God disqualified them and there's a blindness over their eyes. That's true. There is a blindness that have happened to Israel. But you got to understand, it was a temporary blindness. It was not forever. Look at this, Romans chapter 11, verse 25 through 27. Paul said this, he said, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Paul said, I want you to have some understanding about what has happened to Israel, lest you should be wise in your own conceit. And that's the problem today. A lot of the replacement theology guys, they are wise in their own conceit. He said that blindness in part has happened to Israel until, I love that word until, he said, blindness has happened in part to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As, is, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. God said, yeah, there's a blindness on, over them. Yeah, they said uh, at the cross, let his blood be upon us and our children's children. Yeah, yeah, they did that, and God rejected them for a season. But you got to understand, saints, God had covenants. Father God had contracts on the books, and he has to honor them. God has, has, a, has, has a heart for the house of Israel. God knew that Jesus had to go to the cross to die to redeem man. God knew he had to honor them. Where well, here, God has a plan by which he's going to lift the blindness. Now, what's going to happen? Israel, during the time of the Great Tribulation, uh, as God take Israel through this next dispensation of wrath, Israel will go through a very dark season. If you think the Holocaust was something, the Holocaust will be nothing compared to what is coming in the future. The time of Great Tribulation where Israel will go through this season uh, uh, under Antichrist rule and oppression. But through this season... They're going to cry out for the true Messiah. The veil, the blindness will be lifted off of the house of Israel. The end result of the great tribulation is that national salvation will come to the house of Israel. The Jews are going to worship God just like us. They're going to worship the, the Savior just like us. Look at this, verse 28 through 31. Paul said, as concerning the gospel... They are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Listen, saints, I love what God loves. Yeah, yeah. See, for us, they were enemies. And because what happened to them, we were, we were grafted in. But God loves them. He said, for gifts, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. We came in because of their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God have concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy on all of them. See, God knows today that the nation of Israel, secular Israel, is in a state of sin. God knows that. God brought them back. He raised the nation back up. God is bringing the Jews back into the land. He knows the state that they're in. But you got to understand, saints, he's up to something. 
God is bringing them back to the land. He's going to repopulate that land as he's doing. He's bringing the 12 tribes of Israel into that region because he is up to something. Father God is going to have a remnant of the house of Israel. And I'm going to show you that as we go forward. Now, let me give you this little quick little parable that our Savior gave. And I believe this parable proves to us that Jesus, that Father God has not rejected the nation of Israel. Uh, this is a parable here where God talked about, uh, well, let me read it here. This is uh, verses 27 through 29. And they answered Jesus and said unto him, we cannot tell. And he said unto them, neither tell I, uh, tell I you by what authority I do these things. He said, but what think ye? He said, a certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and says, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. Look at this. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said to him, I go, sir, and went not. So he's got two sons, one father asking his sons to work for him. He went to his first son. His first son said, uh, I'm not going, but he repented and went and did the work. The second son came and said, I'm going to go, but he didn't, he, he, didn't, he didn't do the work. So Jesus asked a question, and Jesus answered and said, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Jesus said, whether of them twain did the will of his father? And they said unto him, the first. Jesus said unto them, he's talking to his Jewish brethren. He said, verily I say unto you, listen at this, the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. This is powerful, saints. Here, God want, he wants some obedient sons and daughters. When Israel didn't obey him and they rejected him, he said, okay, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. I'm going to go to another nation that's going to bring forth fruit. But listen, it doesn't mean that God has cast them away. Look what he said. He said, uh, the son that's going to be obedient is the publicans and the harlots. Those are the Gentiles. He said, he talking to his Jewish brothers. He said, listen, the, the, the publicans and the harlots will go into the kingdom of God, here's key word, before you. Not that you're not going to go into the kingdom, but they just don't go before you. Remember the prophecy? The first shall be last and last shall be first. I get this question all the time. Brother Perkins, why did God choose Israel to be their chosen, his chosen people? I say because he's a sovereign God and God does what he want to do. But God chose them first and he was going to use them to reach the world. When they rejected him, he went to another nation that would do his will, and literally, the church was birthed. He came to the church. The church is predominantly Gentiles, although it's Jew and Gentile, because when you become born again, you, you're neither Jew nor Gentile. But he came to the church, those, uh, that son that would do the work, and as we do the work of God, we go into the kingdom of God before them. Now, what's going to happen? God will take Israel through this season of the great tribulation. And national Israel will experience salvation the way we experience it in full. Yeah. They go into the kingdom before you. Again, that's an amazing prophecy. It really is. I'm almost done. Let me show you this. Remember I told you again that, that God is populating the land for a reason? What happened as God is bringing the Jews back into the land, he is preparing them for the next dispensation of the great tribulation. Well, during the tribulation... We find in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 2 and 3, that God will dispatch an angel, and this angel will fly through the, uh, uh, through the earth, and he will seal a certain group of people. Look at this. Revelation, chapter uh, 7, verse 2 and 3. John wrote, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. Look at this. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. This is not the church here. This is during the tribulation. 
This is during the time of the great tribulation where God is dealing again with the house of Israel. Uh, in the nation of Israel, God will seal 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Say, this is amazing. You know, I met a lady, she was a Jehovah's Witness, and she told me, she said, uh, I am of the elect. I'm one of the 144,000. And I said, ma'am, I said, you got some problems. I said, because the scripture says something totally different. I said, let me explain you. And I gave a scripture and they said, I, I, I see what you're saying, but, 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 but I don't believe it. I said, ma'am, you cannot be of the 144,000. First of all, you're a Gentile. Second of all, you're a woman. During the tribulation, God, through his sovereign wisdom and his choice, will seal 144,000 Jews, Jewish men, in the great tribulation. He's going to use them to, to reach the house of Israel during, during the tribulation. The Bible calls them the servants of God. But God is populating the land, getting that land ready for this sealing of the 144,000. But look what it says in chapter 14 of Revelation. Look at this. Now this is talking about the 144,000. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn the song, that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These men were born again. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. Listen at this. These were redeemed from among men. Here's a key part of the verse. Being the first fruits of God and the Lamb. Now you understand first fruits, don't you? First fruits is always that first corner offering that God requires. And then as he gets a first fruit offering, he blesses the harvest. Well, guess what? In the tribulation, because God has repopulated the land of Israel, the 144,000 will be the first fruit offering for the house of Israel in the latter end of the tribulation. Yeah, they are, they are that first fruit offering to God and the Lamb from the house of Israel. This is one reason, saints, why God has brought them back to the land. He's repopulating that land, preparing them to have salvation, national salvation for the house of Israel. Father God has not cast them away. He has not forgotten them. He has a plan for them. Now, I'm going to close with this, and I would encourage you to look this up if you can. Uh, I'm going to close with this. Uh, we should follow the example of the Norwegian Christian leaders regarding Israel. There were a group of uh, 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 leaders, Christian leaders in Norwegian, uh, 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 the, I mean, in Norway. Uh, these leaders got together because they were ashamed of what their nation and their Christian leaders were doing. Now, I'm going to give you this. Uh, Jerusalem Connection reported this, and you can go online and find this, but this was December 5th, 2013. Look at this. About 40 Norwegian Christian leaders and clerics held a special ceremony in the Knesset Wednesday to formally apologize for Norway's, uh, Norway's uh, apologize on Norway's behalf for their role during the Holocaust and the 1993 Oslo Accords. The delegation uh, featured representatives from 21 different organizations. These groups, these, these leaders got together and they all uh, uh, signed, this, signed this, this, this agreement. This is the declaration from the pastors and church leaders in Norway. Now, uh, because of time, I cannot give you all of it because it was so long, but these guys signed this document in support of Israel. And as I was reading, I said, Lord, we need to do that same thing here in America. Look at this, number one. As Christian leaders in Norway, listen what they said. We repent and ask for forgiveness for Norway's attitude, both in the church affiliation and else, uh, elsewhere in other uh, 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 spheres of Norway's society, or Norwegian society. They said, forgive us, Israel, uh, as, as a nation, for the Oslo Agreement dividing Israel for the money from Norway's ending up supporting terrorist organizations, for not moving our embassy from Tel Aviv, uh, Tel Aviv to, uh, to Israel's eternal undivided ca city, a capital city, Jerusalem, for not standing up to defend Israel in a world with increasing hostility, 
for the anti-Semitic and uh, anti-Semitic, Semitic and uh, anti-Zionistic attitudes from pol uh, uh, politicians and media in Norway. Forgive us, Israel, as a nation, for not standing up more clearly to stop the Norwegian anti-Israeli uh, anti political attitude. For the fact that that. Uh, uh, for the fact that great parts of the church has rejected Israel's role in God's plan. For our lukewarmness toward the persecution that you have suffered. For the indifference toward you as God's chosen people. For allowing replacement theology to spread in our churches. They're saying, forgive us Israel for this. I'm almost done. They said this, we want to acknowledge that Israel is the spiritual mother of the church and has given us the Holy Scriptures, the prophets, the apostles, and even the Messiah himself. That has brought salvation to the world. The spiritual rejection of Israel has led to an, exist, uh, uh, an, exist, uh, an extensive replacement theology, both in, in Norwegian Lutheran churches and spreading in the free churches. God has confirmed his promises to Israel. We are confident that God will keep his promises to both Israel and the Christian church. The culture and traditions of our nations is basically built on a foundation of Judean Christian values with clear Jewish roots. Saints, you got to read the whole article. It is unbelievable what these men sign. Powerful statement. They said, forgive us. Paul said, he said, don't lift yourselves up against them. Don't frown on their rejection and smile and think that you, you know, you got it made and, and God has totally done away, done away with Israel. He said, you better fear. You better, you better reverence God. Saints, we need to, we need to, we need to honor God. Replacement theology is a doctrine that is not biblical. The church has not replaced Israel and yes, it is a devilish delusion. I want you to bow your hearts as we close this morning. Father God, we love you. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the nation of Israel. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I thank you, dear God. Lord, you have allowed us to see uh, behind the scenes what your plans are regarding this nation of Israel. Lord, help us in the church, oh God, understand our place and position. Help us, dear God, to pray for the salvation of the nation of Israel. Help us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, you've been kind to us. You've been good to us. You've been merciful to us. Lord, you have forgiven us even though we've done so many things against you. Lord, tonight as you've ex extended mercy to us many, many times, Lord, today we ask extend this mercy as well toward the house of Israel. Lord, we pray as the Apostle Paul, we pray for the salvation of Israel. Now, Lord, we love you. And, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Help us as the church, O oh God. Help us as the church, O oh God, to do your will in the last days. Lord, we love you and we thank you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't God good, saints? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.